Welcome to Pressure Point. I'm Brad Newcomb. My home is important to me. It's where I go to relax, where I live the most personal parts of my life. It's where I get to know my family and my friends. To lose my home, to be homeless, would be devastating. I can't imagine it, but many of us, they say, are only two to three paychecks from being homeless. There is a changing face to homelessness, and with me to talk about that, I have two guests, Karen O'Shaughnessy, who is the Executive Director for the Lookout Emergency Aid Society in the downtown east side of Vancouver, mm -hmm. and Doug Peet, who works with the Salvation Army Dunsmuir facilities, and there are several Hello. in downtown Vancouver. So good to have you both, Doug and Karen. Maybe you see the reality of homelessness in a way that mm -hmm. those of us who have a place to stay and a job to go to, we just don't. Um, can you describe what you're seeing? Well, there's a, a, a rise in crises uh, with shelter. Um, I'm sure actually many people see a little bit of it. Um, uh, there isn't just the homeless situation in the downtown east side anymore. It's not just uh, Stanley Park. It's uh, the endowment lands. It's the, the back alleys of uh, the streets in Kitsilano, Point Grey, um, Marpole. It's uh, Burnaby. It's New West. It's, uh, it's in everybody's backyard, if you will. And, uh, and that's a real change from what it was, you know, seven years ago or so. Well, I mean, if we take your personal history, I know that you were one of the founders of The Lookout, which uh, provides shelter and emergency aid in the downtown east side 27 years ago. So you really do have an overview. So what have you seen? What kind of changes have you seen in, in who this is affecting? Well, um, 27 years ago when Lookout opened, we were on the streets and it was generally older individuals. Uh, when I'm saying older, I would say over the age of 55. Most of them were um, people who had substance abuse problems. Now we're finding um, most uh, of the people are, are still men, um, but at least a full 25% of the people are women. You have a lot of kids on the street, the, the, the mm -hmm. street youth. Um, yeah. You have a lot of, uh, of, of people um, who have come out of the, the, uh, the institutions, out of the, the, the boarding homes um, with the shift to community care um, and the expectation that people are going to be looked after in the community. That means that most of the people that we're seeing uh, in the second largest group of people on the streets are the mentally ill. And these are the seriously mentally ill. And it's not just that they're mentally ill, but they have um, um, physical health problems. They have, uh, we have a, a rising epidemic of HIV, uh, AIDS amongst the, the, the mentally ill as well as uh, amongst the substance uh, uh, users that are on the street. So um, uh, it's a complex issue uh, and, and people don't have, uh, don't have simple answers and there's, there's, uh, there, there's a need to, to be really flexible to, to meet those needs. Well, I mean, uh, I guess uh, we do want to talk about some of the, the questions, what causes homelessness, but I, we want also to put a human face to it. And mm -hmm. the Salvation mm -hmm. Army is a, one place where I think everyone would uh, look to to be able to help to put a human face uh, to people who are homeless because that's one of the first places I would go if I was in that situation. You and thousands and thousands of other individuals uh, like Lookout and like the other agencies downtown, we're finding ourselves overwhelmed by the sheer amounts of humanity, amount of men and women who are coming across our path needing assistance. And as I think today at Dunsmere House, and Dunsmere is an emergency shelter as well as a permanent resident for about 165 men. And today at Dunsmere House, I looked across the counter at this gentleman who reached up from his wheelchair and pulled himself up looking desperately to see if he could get a room, if he could get a permanent place to stay in the downtown. He had been looking and looking. We had to say, no, we're full. That's usual for us. Our occupancy rate yeah. is, well, we tend to get a chance to paint and clean the room in between residents, but that's it. Our so who, who gets to get in and who gets not? I mean, obviously, when you're full, you have to mm -hmm. say no. But uh, how do people find a place? Like, how do you well, decide? For this gentleman, I would have liked to give him a place because I'm not talking about an elder, elderly gentleman. 
I was talking about a gentleman who was early 30s in the last stages of AIDS and looking at him you knew that he it was just a matter of time for him. So where does he go? Where does he go? I mean, and, and I'm not blaming you, but I mean, mm -hmm. where does someone like that go? Well, what we did was we put him into a bed for the night in our emergency shelter, and as soon as a room comes available, we'll arrange for him to be upstairs and then tie him to the appropriate services. So eventually, he will get into appropriate housing. He might make it, he might not, in terms of the time he has left. Now, I can't remember who said this to me, but someone said to me, oh, I'd say maybe a month or so ago, they said, and there was a conversation, probably a not very well-informed conversation, but two or three people said, no one has to be homeless in Vancouver. It's all taken care of. There are places for everyone. How I wish. What would you say oh, in that, if you were in on that conversation? Oh, I, I would just tell them about the 2,800 people that we housed in mm -hmm. uh, in our beds, the emergency beds at Lookout, I would tell them about uh, the fact that we're turning away over a hundred people per month that we're not able to house, and those are people who are actually trying to get in. And the fact is that most people don't even try now because there's no beds available. So, not not at Lookout, not at Dunsmuir House, not at Catholic Charities, not at the 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 places for women. Um, there there's there's no beds anywhere. We opened a temporary winter shelter. Last year, you remember the snowstorm in the middle of November. Well, because of Vancouver Hospital um, generously uh, opening mm -hmm. up the doors, we, we were able to, to pull together, a, a whole working group of, uh, of service providers pulled together to provide shelter for people. And the, the, the first night, we had 35 people there. And this was, we opened at night, you're, you're talking about people who, they don't read the newspapers, they sleep in the newspapers, right? So to get that word out into the street, and yet 35 people were there the first night. And, and it, it's just, as Doug said, his word is, it's overwhelming. But I, I suppose, it, does our climate in Vancouver, which is milder than most, mean that uh, you know, the, the homeless population is less visible oh, to the larger? No. I, let me tell you about uh, um, uh, something that, pushes me, um, uh, last year in September, it was September 6th, we had our first death that was weather related. This was a young man, he was 26 years old, he was mentally ill, he was living on the beach in Kitsilano, right? And, and uh, he, he got cold, and you have to remember, I mean, homeless people, they're not eating properly, right? They don't have food, they're, they're usually begging for food, there isn't a lot of places to go. The food lineups are just, uh, uh, tremendous long lengthy uh, waits and, and many of the mentally ill cannot cope with that. So here was a young man who wasn't eating properly, his physical uh, health was extremely poor, his immune system is down, he got um, pneumonia from being on the beach, it's wet, it's, uh, it, it only has to be wet. Um, he went into MPA, MPA got him to look out, we had him for, for only a few hours, we got him into hospital, hospital, um, saw him, diagnosed him as having uh, very serious pneumonia. They wanted to admit him. He was too afraid to be admitted, so they gave him pills. He came back to look out, and he was dead within four hours. Mm. A weather-related death. And that was the beginning of September, and I don't know if you can remember what September was last year, but it was similar to, to what it is now. You know, it was nice weather during the day, but it's really chilly at night. It was wet in September last year, and that's all it takes. Uh, and it costs lives. I mean, all of this is, is, is costing people their lives. Well, I know that you, you work together, the Salvation Army, the Lookout, uh, the other mm -hmm. community services. The whole network of, of community services. Can you services. describe a little bit about how you sort of work together to reach out to uh, people in need? If we end up with a person who, at Dunsmuir House uh, who has serious mental illness and we know he won't fit in with the residents or the people there, we're able to refer him to Lookout for shelter. Lookout reciprocally can refer people to Dunsmuir House who could better connect to our services or Harbor Light or Miracle Valley which is our treatment center. We work together in terms of making sure people get what they need. And we also work in partnership to make sure that the community is aware of the needs of the people 
and the agencies joining together can reach out to some of these people. Well, I, I know I was part of a program a few years ago which helped to sort of make awareness of sort mm -hmm. of those issues and mm -hmm. one is your own personal issues, what it's like to be, you know, had to spend so much time in the downtown east side uh, with very little money or no money and you found out about the facilities and the services but you also found out about your own self, what it's like to be poor mm -hmm. and I know that there was an advantage for the services to coordinate just in terms of knowledge and information and those kinds of things. Karen, you were going to say something? Well, uh, you know, it's sharing resources. You have to remember that most people are, are trying to get in off the, off the street during the day, right? And um, um, there's a lot of restrictions on, on, um, on how you can access emergency services. Now, during the evening, a lot of those barriers are, are, are no longer there because the uh, offices are closed, the screening process. And those after-hour services, like uh, the, the people that work the, the midnight shift at Lookout, the people that work the midnight shift at Dunsmuir House, Catholic Charities, Triage, and on and on, all of them are talking together. They know who's got the beds. They're transferring or moving people between beds. They're, um, they're telling them about the restaurants that are, won't boot people out after they've been sitting there for an hour. Uh, just nursing a cup of coffee. So I guess that sort of stuff happens a lot, right? Information is passed <laughs> along amongst people on the street that, so they have their own community network? Absolutely. It, you yep. need to, to survive. I mean, they have to be talking to each other to, to be able to survive. Mm -hmm. If I can mention Crosswalk. Mm. When Crosswalk was set up, it was set up as uh, almost the baseline safety net. It's right on Hastings Street. Over the last few months, we've seen 21,000 individuals coming through our door. Now, is that 21,000, uh, some of the same people or is that Some of the same, same people? Some, of the diff uh, some people who are different. Right. But it's literally hundreds and hundreds of individuals are coming through our door. And what do they receive weekly. when they get there? We have, it's an emergency shelter at night time. We have a clothing room, uh, medical services library because the other places won't lend equipment to people who live in the downtown east side. It's also uh, coffee referrals, uh, a step from us to other locations. It's also, in terms of the, its role at nighttime as an emergency shelter, it really hasn't been designed as that. But what we're finding is the system is so overplugged that what, where we used to house 12 people, some of them under the influence, the other night we had 41 individuals sleeping. It's not cold yet. Now what that translates to is 41 people who could not go anywhere else. Um, it's to the point now that with the referrals uh, being plugged uh, with the Ministry of Human Resources and with their policies uh, which basically are resulting in a lot of people being cut off services, they are directly referring people to crosswalk because they, ha they have to say no. So in other words, the, so the, what we normally would have re we normally would have relied on government, sort of uh, sponsored programs or finances, mm -hmm. as those are cut back, they're sending them to places like Salvation Army, right. and Lookout, Lookout right. and the other places in the downtown east side, which are, mm -hmm. of course, you're going to be stressed in terms of staff and finances, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the government has a role, obviously. The people have a role because the people sort of pull the strings, hopefully, that make the government speak. Uh, what is it? What, what is causing this alarming increase in homelessness, from your estimation? Part of it is just uh, the population growth, right? Uh, um, Vancouver and the population of BC has has uh, has gone up um, significantly, 21.3 percent in the city alone. Um, there has been the addition of two emergency beds in the city of Vancouver Did since you say beds? 1982. Beds. Beds, not two emergency houses or beds. shelters or institutions, no, but beds. beds. Those are beds amongst all of the agencies. So it it shows you that in 15 some years, of the, in in 15 years, and and okay, um, the other part of this is that you've got um, people that are living in the community now who ordinarily or, or in prior years right, were, were kept in institutions. Riverview is, is mm -hmm. an excellent example of that. Well, with the, the downsizing of Riverview, and, and, uh, and all of us in the community believe that that's a very good thing, right? But with the downsizing, uh, many of the resources that were supposed to have been built into the community didn't exist, and they, and they still don't exist, although there's been some 
some steps in the right direction, it, it's not good enough. And, and so what's happened is that the people that were already in those resources, um, once they left, where did they go to? Or when the beds were filled by people who were in, in Riverview before or in Woodlands or, or, or even some of the, the, the old age homes that no longer exist, right? Um, where did they go? Well, they, they replaced. I call it the, the snowball effect, right? Because what's happened is, is uh, they went into the existing resources and the people that were in the resisting, uh, existing resources, they had to go into something a little bit less um, um, that didn't quite meet their needs, right? And, and so on down the line, until the people that were most marginalized, most vulnerable, less able to, to meet their own needs, they're the ones who ended up going onto the street. And if I can add to that, coupled with that situation, I recently had a realty agent approach me and he handed me a list that was about this thick of hotels that they had in the last two years turned into what they call boutique hotels. So rather than single room occupancies, they now are hotels for tourists. Mm. And what this means is the number has actually dropped by 1,200 which there has been a drop of 1,200 single rooms for people to live in at affordable housing in the downtown in the last few years. They have not okay. been replaced. I can certainly, I mean, certainly living uh, in downtown Vancouver, I can see that. I mean, we can see all around us, I mean, um, that the, the landscape changes. I mean, mm -hmm. there are more boutique hotels and shops and things like that, and you know that people lived there. And uh, the amazing thing is for myself, I mean, I go about my daily business and I see new buildings go up, I never ask what happened to the old ones and I never ask uh, where the people might have gone. I mean, um, that's I think one of the interesting things is that, it's a horrible thing to say, but I mean I, you do see people uh, in dumpsters and all kinds of things and I can remember when I first saw that in Vancouver being quite shocked and now it's a part of everyday life. I mean, mm -hmm. you see people and you feel f for people, but you do, yes. there is a growing mm -hmm. kind of, you know, I mean, it's part of the sort of urban life. Do you yeah, notice yeah. that? Oh, and absolutely. And add people's attitudes? Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a service provider, as somebody who, who has been, you know, basically dedicated my life to, to try and get people off the streets, um, uh, it, it is one of the most frustrating um, processes. And, it, and it, it really does make me... Um, uh, kind of angry that that uh, we're accepting this, that as a society we are accepting this. And I think uh, one of the good things that's really happened is that this government uh, recognized homelessness for the very first time in 1993, 1992 actually. Um, the provincial government recognized that there was a, a problem with, with homelessness. And, uh, and they actually put some money into developing a housing program that would get uh, uh, give people who were marginalized a, a, a place to live. I'd like to add, oh, sorry, Doug, you were to say something? Just if go you ahead. Mind. No, no, you go ahead. You've got the floor. We have a street mom named Alan, and she's what I consider a living saint. She's part of our volunteer program. Every day, her and some people are going out and talking to the street kids. They have regular contact with over 150 kids living yeah. on the street. And when we were handing out uh, sleeping bags last year, mm -hmm. a lot of them had no place to come into, were scared to come into shelters. Um, most of them are ineligible because they're under age to stay pretty well anywhere, and they preferred to stay with their friends and squats. I visited the United States a few months ago in San Diego and visited one of their shelters. And I think a question that faces us Canadians and faces Canada as a whole is do we want to become like the large cities in the United States? The population of that shelter was 850. Yes. 250 of them were children. Oh. Entire families down there are homeless. They have no place to go. We're heading in that direction. Mm. With the increasing cutback of affordable housing, the decreasing services that have, the services have not kept up with the need. We have opportunities now to meet that. 
And for those who do support the Salvation Army, thank you, because without the support people do give the Salvation Army and support people give Lookout and other agencies, there's no way we could even do what we do. And, and, and just be... And, and when you mention that support, which people do generously give, either financially mm -hmm. or volunteer, there is the Shelter Working Group, which is, a, I know, a network of um, service providers in the downtown east side. It's not just the downtown east side, actually. Okay, should, we're should, we're talking about um, hospitals, the Ministry of Human Resources. Um, we're talking service organizations. We're talking church groups outside of the downtown east side as well as inside. So it's a, um, a much broader thing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a recognition that uh, that it's not just a downtown problem anymore. It's it's endemic, and and uh, it has to be dealt with uh, as part of the continuum of housing. You talk about the, the answer, the, the true answer to homelessness and shelterlessness is more permanent housing, appropriate yes. um, housing and housing that's supported the, 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 to, to allow people to, to successfully maintain themselves in that housing. And how but, do you get a house when you can't pay rent? How do you get a house when you have no money? How do you, get a, poverty, house when you, yes. how do you get a house when you have, uh, can't afford a down payment for a mortgage? I mean, uh, those are some ba very basic questions, but that's where we start. And but, some but, people, when you lose your job... Right. Go ahead. And how can you get a job if you don't have a house? You can't get a job without a permanent address. You can't get social assistance without a permanent address. So if you're homeless, you're in a vicious circle. You need a house in order to get employment, in order to get money or social assistance. And then if you're in that kind of a vicious circle, how do you get the courage to get up in the morning? Well, you know, the depression is, is certainly a major issue here. But, you know, a lot of the people that Lookout is dealing with are, are people that, as I said, they're, they have multiple problems. Most of them are mentally ill. Over 70% of them it's are mentally, mentally Ill. Ill. And I tell you, what they're interested in is, is very simple things. You know, they, they, they want a place to stay. They want food. They, they want some decent clothing. And they want to be treated the same way that the rest of us want to be treated. Right? They want to be treated with respect and with, with dignity. And they want to do things. Uh, they want to be able to help themselves. But, you know, they have problems doing that. And they may not have the skills to be able to do that. And, and certainly, um, you know, we, we have a, a major employment problem here. Right? For, for people that are able-bodied, that the mm -hmm. people that are very capable. So somebody who is disabled, whatever that disability, they have much greater difficulty engaging in anything. Well, I can imagine. So, I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's tough enough to get a job. It's a very competitive, uh, stressful endeavor to go out looking for employment. I mean, I, you know, it's scary. I will tell you another thing, though. I will tell you that I mean, uh, we, we deal with over 125 people per day in the emergency center. And, and we, we provide a range of housing um, to the permanent housing, because that, again, as I said, is the, is the answer. But I will tell you, out of that 125 people, I would suggest to you that you probably have 20 of them that actually come in and they volunteer. They're the ones that are helping run the place. I tell you, we could not survive without our volunteers. Mm -hmm. They come in, they wash the dishes, they serve the food, they make the beds, they clean the floors, they clean the toilets. You know, they pick up the, 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 the garbage throughout the place, you know? And they do that at all of our sites. And they do that uh, in the community and they do it with all the other uh, social service agencies. So, but I mean, it, it certainly sounds like a huge problem, particularly when you look at the special needs of, uh, of those people who are, you know, termed mentally ill, that they're homeless. And I mean, I don't see any easy, so, you know, if we're looking for long-term solutions, I don't see anything that's easy to but find we, on the horizon. What, any but we do know. We, we know. I mean, the community knows, the government knows, everybody knows what the answers are. The answer is building more permanent housing for people. The answer is to provide more outreach services, support services to those people to make the, their, um, their uh, living um, a, a successful one. And, uh, and so that means, yes, that, that we have to, to put in more resources than, than now exist. And, and one of the biggest crimes that's occurred is that the, the federal government has withdrawn their, their support of housing. They're no longer active in the housing field. And that's meant uh, that uh, the, the housing units that uh, used to come into BC, in fact, all of the provinces, has reduced significantly. And BC is one of the only provinces that actually has a housing program left now. So anybody picking up the picking up the slack? Will. Anybody picking up the slack where the federal government uh, 
has pulled out? Well, no, although I, I have to say that, um, for instance, two years ago, because of the crisis in the, in the streets, the, the, the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia came forward and they gave us a $61,000 grant to be able to open a, a shelter temporarily to get people off the streets. So I think that there's, there, there's, there's will um, in the community. People want to be able to help. They don't know, necessarily know how to. But they, I also find that, that um, they, they can't give money on an ongoing basis for, for the amount that you really need to give. I, that, that's got to be a government responsibility. The role of government mm. is, is to support the most vulnerable in our community. Right, and I guess you're right. It's too much because you can give sleeping bags and some food and things, but we can't give you know, thousands of dollars. And, Go when, ahead. But, and when we're talking about the council, um, the second um, an emergency council in terms of housing, what we are inviting is the government to partnership with us. So with your, with your shelter organizations, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, well, with, uh, there's a lot we can continue to talk about, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but it is a, uh, a thank you for being with me and raising some of the issues okay. and also bringing a human face to homelessness. So thanks, both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've been talking with Doug Pete from the Salvation Army Dunsmuir Facilities in Vancouver, Karen O'Shaughnessy, the Executive Director of the Lookout Emergency Aid Society in Vancouver. We've been talking about homelessness. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brad Duncan.